Hello, Father. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I have a couple of questions regarding your uh, seminary training and your life as a, as a priest. Um, can you uh, give us an introduction to your, uh, how was your youth and uh, your early training as a seminarian? Well, I guess you could say I was a, a pre-Vatican II baby. I was raised during the uh, 1950s. I was very fortunate to go to a uh, Catholic grade school uh, that was run by the Dominican Sisters. The grade school had a good religious formation program for the kids, taught us a lot about the catechism, self-discipline, all those good uh, positive motives for being a good Catholic and, and uh, productive member of society. Also, the uh, parish was uh, very unusual in this sense that it had a, a very active liturgical life, that as kids, we had the importance of the mass emphasized to us. Uh, the priest would do, for instance, demonstration masses in uh, the school to show us when, what went on. And every day at mass, we had a high mass. So the girls' choir would sing and then uh, would sing the propers of the mass. And then we all would join in in singing the ordinary of the mass. We would sing hymns before and after the Mass, and we'd sing some motets during the Mass. So there was something that uh, gave me a real love for the Mass and made it very real for me, even as a, uh, as a child. And of course, then, in those days, the priesthood, uh, rightly, was held in uh, very high regard, uh, very high esteem, and uh, boys were encouraged to think about the possibility of going to the seminary. So uh, I remember thinking about uh, that myself when I was in, in fifth grade, reading a book about the um, life of a Carmelite priest, actually, Carmelite priests. I still remember the, the name of the book. It was called Men in Sandals by uh, uh, Father Madden. And he was a priest at, at uh, Holy Hill, a Carmelite shrine, uh, near Milwaukee, and he wrote in a, a very engaging manner, and that got me thinking about the priesthood, and I saw the good example of the, the priests in my uh, parish, the older priests and the younger priests, how zealous they were, and I started thinking about the seminary. Well, in those days, if you thought about the seminary, you would think first about going to the minor seminary, which was a seminary high school. So, in uh, uh, 1965, I entered the minor seminary high school, DeSales Prep, in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Now, that was after or Vatican II, or as Vatican II, as the changes were being introduced, but we weren't really affected that much uh, by it yet at the minor seminary, so we still, to a large extent, got the uh, the traditional Catholic classical formation that Catholic schoolboys got if they would go to the seminary. So uh, that was a very good and a very positive experience. Bit by bit, though, you started to see the, uh, the effects of uh, the Second Vatican Council, the inroads of modernism, especially college and later in my uh, seminary career. But one of the things I, I remember thinking of as, as a boy was that I loved to do just about anything as a priest, but the one thing that I really don't think I'd ever want to do would be to teach in a seminary. <laughs> well, we know eventually in the long run uh, how, that, uh, how that turned out. In any event, um, there was a, um, uh, the church was going through these uh, different changes uh, uh, doctrinally and liturgically, which I felt very uncomfortable with, uh, and which I questioned. And, you know, youth is a very interesting thing that, that uh, you, uh, as youth, you look for consistency. And I didn't really see a consistency in what I had been taught in this good Catholic grade school and what was going on with the church and the Mass. And it's not a... Uh, uh, I guess that's an, not an unusual uh, characteristic of youth because at the same time, uh, there were other 
young men in other parts of the country who were thinking the same thing. There was a certain Daniel Dolan in uh, Detroit in the Minor Seminary who was thinking the same thing. And there was a certain Donald Sanborn who was in, uh, the, uh, in a diocese on Long Island who was thinking the same thing as well. Uh, but Father, sorry to interrupt you, but okay. you, um, Bishop Dolan and you became monks at one point, right? Yes, well, uh, the, here's what happened. Um, the seminary progressively got worse and worse. By the time I got into college, uh, it was a really a full-blown um, modernist program that we were getting. And there's probably no doctrine that went un, uh, undenied by the professors I had. So I, um, with a number of the other conservatives, became affiliated with a Cistercian monastery. The Cistercians were a monastic order uh, founded in the uh, 11th century. St. Bernard of Clairvaux was associated with them. They had an ancient history and a monastic spirituality. Well, after Vatican II, the uh, many, in fact, the majority of Cistercian monasteries retained a Latin liturgy, uh, a lot of the old discipline, etc. So the um, uh, those of us who were conservative, who uh, took exception to the Vatican II changes, were naturally attracted to that. We would visit the monastery, make retreats there. Well, it uh, uh, turned out that also the young uh, Daniel Dolan from uh, Detroit ended up uh, at this particular monastery as a, a Cistercian monk, and that's where I uh, first uh, ran into him. Uh, a number of us went out uh, a, a number of the secular seminarians went out to a um, to the funeral of, of the abbot of the monastery, and it was conducted in a, um, uh, a very traditional fashion with the old requiem mass, etc. But uh, I was really, um, I think the, the expression would be uh, gobsmacked by this, uh, to see that something like this could still exist. Eventually, students from the Cistercians were uh, sent to study at my seminary, but a number of them got into trouble for being conservative as uh, conservative as well. I became a third order uh, member of the Cistercians. Uh, at the end of my college career, there was a, a purge really of all the uh, conservatives who were at the seminary. We were uh, told basically that we could not continue in the seminary. Uh, by that time, um, the young Daniel Dolan had uh, already uh, been purged for his conservatism from the Cistercians. And I myself uh, decided to, since the monastery itself still had a, a, a disciplined um, and a relatively a calm liturgical life with Latin and Gregorian chant, that I would enter there as well in hopes they would send me somewhere else to, to study. So I spent a couple of years there. The Cistercians eventually sent me to study in Europe at another uh, monastery, uh, which had uh, uh, similar liturgical practices, conservative, etc. But then I discovered uh, that the theology I would be taught at the university there was the same modernist stuff that I had been taught in the seminary in Milwaukee. So at that point, I uh, threw the towel in as far as the Vatican II Church went. So then I went to the Society of St. Pius X Seminary in Econ, Switzerland, that was in the south of Switzerland, and finished my courses there and was ordained eventually in 1977 by Archbishop Lefebvre. So, and then when you were ordained, what was your, uh, your job as a priest? You were sent back to the U.S.? Yes. So I was sent back to the uh, U.S. and uh, I ended up uh, being assigned to teach at a seminary, <laughs> which is something that I thought that I would never really want to do as a priest. So uh, the, the society was just starting out a, a seminary in the United States and it was in a little town, a little cow town, outside of um, Detroit called Armada. And the uh, rector, the superior of the seminary, was Father Donald Sanborn. 
And he had already in the society had a very good um, uh, reputation in terms of uh, his academic knowledge, uh, etc. And so he was the rector of the seminary and I was assigned there in uh, Armada to help him. Well, it, it was a, um, the courses for the students were to be more of a, a first year course because it was the first year that we were really uh, operating and taking new students in. So the, the uh, courses I ended up um, having to prepare for were a course on the liturgy. And the idea with that was that I had a background as a monk and a certain interest in the liturgy, a certain knowledge in it, I'd read about it, and I would prepare courses on that. And then uh, also courses on, a course on chant and on singing, because I also have a musical background. I was uh, trained as a church musician, as an organist, and in composition, and a couple of other different things like that. So I was assigned to the uh, task of trying to get the seminarians to uh, uh, learn how to sing. It was an interesting experience all the way around. Um, uh, first of all, uh, preparing courses, there wasn't actually a book that uh, I could go to, I soon discovered, that wasn't affected one way or another by the uh, modernism that uh, was uh, infecting liturgical studies in the 20th century. So in effect, I had to put together my own course. Uh, I've told the story elsewhere where uh, I also looked for a book on the new mass that I thought would be adequate to explain the difficulties of it to the seminaries, but I really couldn't find one. And it was kind of at that point that I got the idea, maybe I will one day write one of these myself. Uh, and since I operate rather slowly, it, it was <laughs> about 32 years later, I think, that we finally managed to uh, crank out the final copy of the book. But in any event, I, I had uh, uh, the seminary liturgy course, and uh, I uh, played the organ for and accompanied the divine office. Uh, and the joke was that I was sort of chained to the organ console uh, to provide the background music in the sanctuary of the church. Uh, Bishop Sanborn, or then Father Sanborn and I, were very interested in um, keeping uh, up and preserving liturgical standards. So we uh, followed the practice in the morning of having prime, which the uh, society had in its seminaries, and um, Compline in the evening, but we also instituted the chanting of Vespers, because that's one of the more important hours of the church, uh, of the uh, divine office. So that was a, um, so there was a liturgy course, also there was a, um, the chant course, how to sing, which of course was uh, quite terrifying to the seminarians uh, the first time around because uh, I would have them sing uh, different melodies and reproduce notes that I would sing, etc. And if you're not used to doing that, that's quite intimidating, I guess. But uh, they got through it and many of them, in fact, learned how to sing uh, very well. It was a, a result I was... Uh, I was pleased with. Uh, we had other priests on the faculty uh, there, an old Jesuit who uh, helped us, and uh, some other uh, uh, American traditionalist priests, uh, Father McGovern, who came to help us. And uh, it, so it was this, this uh, seminary life uh, that uh, where I ended up teaching there for, um, uh, for two years, and uh, I have to say that uh, the good Father Sanborn was most patient with me. Uh, the, uh, at, at that time, like uh, many people, I smoked. And um, uh, it never occurred to me that anyone would take offense or be bothered by smoking. And he, he spent all of these hours with me in the car and when we'd be doing different things, and I would be smoking. And he never uttered a word of complaint. So I just want to put that on the record for his uh, uh, canonization. Uh, we can say that, that I forced him to practice heroic sanctity when it came to smoking. <laughs> so this was from 77 to 79 and in Michigan. Yes. What, after that, what happened? Well, uh, 
the uh, seminary, uh, of course, was the, the way of the future. That was Archbishop Lefebvre's idea that you have to form priests, and that's a correct idea. You form priests the correct way. Armada was too tiny, uh, and it was, was poorly located. So we went through a whole bunch of, of, of uh, adventures trying to get a uh, uh, building that we could buy to relocate the seminary. And uh, at that point, uh, even more so, I guess, than now, the uh, Society of St. Pius X and Archbishop Lefebvre were regarded as, as someone that you, the people you simply could not deal with. So um, we, uh, I don't know how many properties uh, the Father Sanborn and I looked at. Uh, and um, in, uh, in one case, we actually had a uh, contract signed by the bishop of, of uh, by the bishop of the diocese, by the bishop of Allentown, to sell us a sell a property, and we had to do it through some sort of a front corporation. And uh, I had to I went and and inspected the place wearing lay clothes because had I worn a collar, that would have given the game away. But the bishop went ahead and he. He signed the contract, and later, in an indirect way, uh, he, was, uh, he was talking with a real estate agent, and he said that I know that there's a mafia connection here somewhere, but we want to get rid of this property, so uh, we're, letting it, we're letting it pass. Or is the bishop's representative who said that? Well, what happened is that uh, someone actually found out that it was really the Society of St. Pius X and Lefebvre that wanted to buy it. So it was at that point they backed out of the contract. They would have sold it to the Mafia, <laughs> but not to the traditionalists. <laughs> so in any event, this adventure, these different adventures, finally led us to purchase an old Jesuit retreat house in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And um, the uh, it was on a lake, and it was... Uh, adequate certainly at, uh, at that point, at that time. So uh, we went ahead, we got uh, permission, some money to uh, purchase this property. And then the idea was that it would move in the fall of 1979. And the seminary institution would move there. And that I would move to Oyster Bay, uh, Oyster Bay, New York, which is on Long Island. And that's uh, Oh, about uh, <clears throat> an hour and a half or two hours away from Ridgefield, Connecticut, and that I would take care of um, you know, financial matters at Oyster Bay, administrative matters, and then come up to the seminary to teach. And uh, so the seminary moved, and I continued to teach um, courses at the seminary uh, uh, one, day of, uh, one day a week, and um, I'm not sure if I continue the liturgy course, but I definitely continue, uh, continue the chant course with uh, the seminarians, teaching them how to read music, etc. So that was my, my apostolate uh, up there. Was, uh, then I wasn't involved full time, but it was a, uh, something where I could, could come and I could at least contribute uh, a little to the seminary life. Do you have any missions at that point uh, in different states or things like oh, that? Oh yes, it was. Um, uh, we were quite quite occupied taking care of um, uh, mass centers and missions that we had virtually all over the place. We would travel from uh, Oyster Bay, uh, for instance, to uh, there would be one circuit that would be to Philadelphia, or to the Washington area, to Baltimore. There were uh, missions in Pennsylvania. Uh, some of them were serviced by plane, some that you were um, you would drive to by car. Uh, there were uh, missions in the Middle West we would go to in Iowa. And then there's the real mud run, uh, which, which we called it, uh, which would involve going all the way out to Helena, Montana. And you you do this whole whole series of, of um, uh, missions all the way out there. So it was really... Um, uh, Quite a bit. This was sort of surprising to the Europeans because they had no concept of the distances in the United States. And they would say, how far is Helena, Montana? Well, I think we figured it was the distance between London and Moscow. 
So uh, the, that was what we were doing in, in serving these missions. So I did that for a while and um, uh, ended up editing a magazine, The Roman Catholic, at uh, Oyster Bay. And, the, um, and continuing the little apostolate in the seminary until uh, uh, 1983 when we had our uh, disagreement with Archbishop Lefevre over a, a number of uh, doctrinal matters, and I think we've, we've uh, uh, covered that, uh, you know, in a, a number of other videos, our disagreements and our problems with him. So at that point, we uh, left the, or were kicked out, depending on who's telling the story, the Society of St. Pius X. So you became free. Uh, yes, um, that's right. <laughs> and in the modern church, they would say free to be faithful, I think. So. And once you were um, out of the society, what uh, did you form a new group? Yes, we uh, continued the apostolate to the extent possible that we had in the society. We still um, uh, service different missions. We had a, there was a legal dispute with Archbishop Lefebvre, and when that was eventually resolved, uh, we agreed no longer to use the uh, name Society of St. Pius X, uh, we adopted the Society of St. Pius V, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, divided by two or something like that. And the next St. Pius down was Pius I, and I don't think anyone has hit that yet. But So uh, we had our own little group, and of course the question uh, then that um, the Father Sanborn was very interested in, and that I as a former seminary prof very interested in, was where are we going to get priests? How are we going to form priests for the future? Because that is the, um, uh, you know, the, the essence of the apostolate is getting the sacraments to people. And you have to have well-formed priests to do that. Now, we didn't have Lefebvre to do it, so uh, what do you do? So we uh, started uh, trying to find possible candidates uh, uh, bishops who might be uh, likely to help us out. And that was a search that um, actually took, uh, took us uh, uh, quite a while. Uh, it involved um, actually then Father Sanborn going down to South America and he saw the, uh, really the only diocesan bishop who had been a holdout for the traditional mass, Bishop Antonio de Castro Meyer. And it was Bishop de Antonio, Antonio de Castro Meyer who suggested that we um, uh, consider going to uh, Gerard de Laurier, who had been one of our professors at uh, Acon, and who was a, a theologian and a respected man and highly devout. And he had been consecrated by Archbishop Tuck, Pierre Martin Odin Tuck, who was the former um, Bishop of Hue, uh, Vietnam. And um, on the basis of that, we uh, investigated these uh, possibilities of... of um, so one of you, uh, you father um, at that time, Father Sanborn, were supposed to uh, do a research, one in favor, the other against, right? The, the yeah, because the thing is, I thought that, um, uh, I thought it was all fishy. And uh, the, uh, there were so many... Um, uh, it seems so many dissatisfying stories that were um, uh, tied in with um, uh, some of the clergy who had gotten involved with these bishops that I really wasn't interested in that. And uh, I was really quite skeptical uh, about it. And um, the, the Father Sanborn, uh, less so. But uh, uh, in fact, I'd even written against the idea of getting involved with them because there, there's some real... Characters involved, um, but once uh, I, I started then to do the research, but my idea was more from a skeptical point of view, and we discussed this at, at uh, different meetings of um, uh, at priests of the Society of, of uh, Pius V, and uh, finally, uh, Father Sanborn came up with some some research as far as the. Uh, presumption of validity and the control of a sacrament that sort of uh, clinched it for me. And um, it brought me over to that side, but I had, I had investigated it really on my own. And uh, the, this was met with the uh, resistance by Father uh, 
Father Kelly at that time, he didn't want to, uh, he said, we can't say it's valid because then some of our priests would want to get involved with it. But the, <laughs> the thing is that we have to say it's valid if it's valid. Yes. And this is, these are the principles of sacramental theology that um, Bishop or Father Sanborn has come up with and that I've investigated myself and it's, it's, it's true. Why not say it's true? You know, because the, the um, validity of a sacrament doesn't depend on the moral qualities of the minister. Yes, and as you find, found out and you did research and also brought articles about it, it's in a way it's difficult to invalidate a, 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 an ordination or a, or a consecration if you follow, obviously, all of the, the form, the matter, and everything. You have to prove that he didn't have the intention, and that's really difficult to do. Well, it's virtually impossible because you're, you're presumed to have the uh, correct intention. And then there are the, the, um, the spurious objections at the beginning um, uh, that... Uh, I said at the end of one of these critical article, uh, this critical article I'd written that we have to determine what the criteria are in church law for ascertaining, you know, the validity of a sacrament in a case like this, and which we eventually did. One of the objections uh, that uh, Father Kelly made was that, well, uh, Archbishop Tuck didn't sign a uh, certificate of consecration, but then it turned out that he did. And he wrote one out in Latin in his own hand. And then as you'd find out more about the uh, Archbishop Tuck, the man, and what he was like, and you, you uh, uh, encounter people who knew him, who spent time with him after the consecrations, you hear about him, him learning a foreign language, uh, uh, learning, I guess, Spanish, uh, when, he was, uh, when he was in Rochester, New York, and, and all of these different... Uh, anecdotes, you think that the guy really got a uh, like a raw deal, you know, in terms of in terms of his reputation. So it basically, I mean, just to sum up, the whole idea that the took consecrations are invalid was a made up thing. I mean, it was never. Uh, I mean, there were reasons because of scandal or yeah. or, or, or the, but really, the there's not a theological reason or uh, any proof that he invalidated. The no, and <clears throat> all of the all the presumptions are the opposite. And, uh, but we didn't, um, the thing is that it's this, that it's, it's one thing if you talk about a, um, a topic like a priestly ordination and the criteria for ascertaining the validity of something like that. But Episcopal consecration is a little more difficult because you can't go to the regular books about that. And so you have to look at uh, the different, the general theological principles and you have to, um, those are the things that, uh, that you apply. And in, in doing that, I discovered that the objections uh, that were made to it didn't hold up from the point of view of um, the traditional Catholic theology. And that has to be the criteria that we have to follow. Otherwise, it's time to close the book and close down shop. Because if you don't uh, observe uh, those criteria, uh, the ones that the church uses and you insist on inventing uh, criteria on your own, then uh, you, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, and you're deceiving people. It's it's a tainted. Uh, it's not the real product that you're giving them. So um, next is the consecration of Bishop Dolan, took took line, right? Yes, and the uh, story uh, behind that we've told elsewhere in some detail about uh, we. Um, got into contact with different clergy who had been whose orders derived from uh, Archbishop Tuck and from um, uh, specifically Bishop uh, Moses Carmona in uh, Mexico. After we left the Pius V Society in um, uh, uh, 1989, and um, the uh, these particular priests, you know, had uh, correct ideas and they were not as they had been painted to us uh, and portrayed to us. These were the uh, priests of the CMRI uh, who were based in Mount St. Michael's. And uh, eventually one of them was uh, chosen uh, by the, uh, uh, by his, his uh, uh, brother priests, Mount St. Michael's, to be consecrated a bishop. And then was uh, uh, Bishop uh, Piverunus. His religious name was uh, Father Tarsisius, I think. In any event, um, he 
uh, wanted to do something to um, accomplish two things. First of all, he wasn't very good in foreign languages and he had to deal with Mexico. Uh, so he also had the idea that, well, maybe he should do something for the former priests of the Society of St. Pius X. So he, uh, having had contact with us, he asked Bishop Dolan to um, accept Episcopal consecration. It took a while to convince him uh, because it would be something controversial, but um, uh, eventually he accepted it. And uh, so 25 years ago, last November, uh, he was consecrated a uh, bishop uh, at a public ceremony in uh, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, a suburb of Cincinnati, Sharonville. And with that uh, consecration of Bishop Dolan, then there came the possibility of having a seminary again and of, uh, of forming priests. And by that time, uh, most of the priests of the Society of St. Pius V had left. There were 12 when um, uh, we were in it initially, and I think at that point they were down to four. But the, uh, naturally the man to found the seminary, of course, was Father Sanborn, because he had all the experience. And um, the interesting thing is that over the years he had never given up on that idea of uh, having a seminary and forming seminaries. He had even taken some fellows in and given them some seminary formation. Uh, he uh, continued to uh, collect books for the seminary library uh, that, that would be of, of, of use uh, one day for a seminary. So in 1995, uh, he uh, founded Most Holy Trinity Seminary. And the idea would be that uh, uh, eventually Bishop Dolan would uh, ordain uh, priests for the seminary or uh, some other uh, another uh, bishop who's validly ordained uh, and had a good reputation, etc. So that was the foundation of Most Holy Trinity. It was in Michigan, in Warren, Michigan. So. Yeah, well, Warren is a suburb of, of uh, the uh, distinguished city of Detroit, uh, which was referred to, I think, as the Paris of the Midwest. But don't tell a Frenchman that. Yes, I uh, personally came, when I came to the seminary, the seminary was in Michigan in 2001, and uh, we eventually moved to here to Florida. Yes, <laughs> that's right. The weather is a little nicer here. It's a lot nicer, let um, me tell you. <laughs> and you you still, can actually see sun during the day when you come to yes. Florida. It's amazing. <laughs> and you keep coming, uh, even the, the distance and uh, all the, the trouble is to, uh, um, to fly here. You come once a month, right, Father? Yes. And uh, from the beginning, what I did is uh, I would uh, go to the seminary once a month. Uh, when we were up in, in Warren, I would travel up there uh, by car, sometimes by airplane. Uh, but now to travel down here, uh, I uh, always come by airplane, uh, from, uh, uh, generally from CVG, Cincinnati's uh, airport down to Tampa. And I um, spend a, a few days teaching to my long-suffering students who get wall-to-wall -wall me uh, for several hours a day, and then I fly back to Cincinnati to take care of my other duties. And uh, could you explain uh, to our viewers uh, which kind of uh, courses are you teaching right now? Well, the uh, canon law. Now, uh, at the beginning of the seminary, we, um, uh, we were casting about for uh, courses that uh, could be taught uh, easily enough to the seminarians. It could be taught, say, in the vernacular where they wouldn't necessarily have a Latin background. So uh, Father Sanborn suggested a canon law course. And uh, I agreed to take that myself, even though I didn't have a uh, particular uh, expertise in it and uh, that was sort of taught in a hit and miss way at a cone. But I uh, researched it and uh, uh, put together a, a general canon law course on the general principles of canon law. Um, it was, uh, you know, quite an adventure. Uh, I took um, a, um, a pretty good vernacular uh, manual by Abo and Hannon, uh, some uh, pre-Vatican II Dominicans, and put together a course based on that. And you try to put, uh, put a course together in a way that uh, it's... Uh, that the seminarians get the essence of the material. 
Now, canon law is hard because it's full of all these, these little details, you know, admittedly picky little details, but uh, you have to uh, try to put all of this together in a coherent way so that the seminarians can absorb the more important parts of it. So that was uh, uh, one course that I put together, uh, the general introduction to canon law. And then uh, I put together also a course on the sacraments. Uh, there's a relationship in um, canon law uh, and uh, canon law, general dogmatic theology and um, the and moral theology uh, between uh, uh, the, the fields overlap uh, when it comes to the sacraments. And so you have to try to put all of these things together. So I formulated a, a, a a course like that, and in fact, that's the one this year I'm giving to the older seminarians, and it gives them uh, preparation to uh, not simply administer the sacraments, but they understand the, uh, the different requirements that the church lays down for the reception of the sacraments. So that, uh, there's that uh, course. Um, I did a, um, uh, I decided to do three years of courses on the sacred liturgy. The liturgy course, there's a, a general introduction which we're doing with the younger students this year. Uh, so they get an overview of, of uh, the mass and the divine office. Then the second year uh, consists of a discussion of history of the different parts of the mass and the divine office, the specifics on that. And then finally, the, for liturgy, the third um, course I did was called the, uh, the Modern Age. And uh, this was something I, I had ins uh, aspired to do uh, when I was a young priest back in 1977 in Aramaida to give them a, a conspectus of what happened with Vatican II with the liturgical changes. And this, um, so the course uh, concerns that, concerns basically the 20th century and Vatican II, what happened, why it's wrong. And this fit in very nicely with my project of uh, writing a book on the new mass, the work of human hands. And in fact, having the deadlines to teach classes uh, forced me to complete different parts of the book. So there's, there's nothing, like, uh, uh, nothing like a good pressure. Uh, and that, um, uh, as a result, uh, I ended up getting the, uh, the book published. And uh, so it's, it's, yes, it's... We're going to have descriptions uh, below for those who want to get the book. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. And, and uh, I don't know if we'll necessarily have a special deal or anything like that, but uh, you certainly will get brownie points with me. Um, Yes, and, and the seminarians um, uh, profit uh, very much from uh, the, the course because they can understand, as you say, to understand what happened in Vatican II, that the changes of the new mass were not something like uh, that didn't have a, a, like a prehistory. And, and the people that made the new mass, they were already very active before um, Vatican II. So uh, in a way that's related to the... Uh, the reason why we follow the Saint Pius uh, X liturgy. Yes, and uh, and it's uh, in, uh, that was a, a as it were a, uh, sort of a discovery and a revelation for myself in, in looking at the history of this that you realize, uh, well, as a traditionalist, sometimes when you start out, you think that well, this just sort of happened after Vatican II, everything went crazy. But there's obviously, when you uh, step back. There is a preparation for it, and the rats were in the walls already. And uh, it's important that the seminarians understand that, uh, so that it's not just a uh, not just a time thing. In other words, the, before Vatican II, everything was mm, just fine, and after Vatican II, everything fell apart. No, there was a there's a preparation for it, and. Uh, if they understand that and they understand the reasons and how it proceeded, they will get a, uh, they'll be sensitive to um, uh, any future problems like that. They'll have a sense about, you know, how modernism works. So that was a, a um, uh, it's an interesting discovery and it's good to get them to um, uh, understand how that, uh, how that proceeds because they're supposed to be enemies of modernism. 
which is the heresy. Yes, and the finally, Father, you have two more things here: the the Psalms. Mm -hmm. You this a special uh, course on the, on the Psalter that you go through all of the Psalms and explain the the Holy Office, uh, the Psalms as they are uh, found in the in the Holy Holy Office, right? Yes, in, in, in the um, the topic always fascinated me as a Cistercian. And I had, a, uh, I had a pretty good background in Latin. I had seven years of Latin. So when I went to the Cistercians, I understood um, Latin rather well. But then mystifying, very mystifying uh, to me was the language of the Psalms that are used at the divine office. And uh, you would think that it's not a, um, uh, that it wouldn't be that difficult necessarily to understand, but the, uh, the priest, when he, he recites the divine office every day, the bulk of the prayer is the Psalms. And it's important then, therefore, that he understand what the Psalms mean. And so as I started studying this topic, it was really amazing to me that in, in, uh, you understand them as poetry, you understand the poetic devices, and they have their own uh, peculiar sort of Latin. They don't follow in many respects, the standard grammar of, say, classical Latin of Cicero or anything like that. And so that's a, a special um, a condition that you have to understand when you study the Psalms. And uh, preparing the course, I remember sitting in, in the uh, living room with the rectory with all these books spread out in front of me and uh, different commentaries on the Psalms and just and, uh, writing the explanations and just really how fascinating, fascinating it was. It was there was so much underneath there that um, it, it's this, this is a great richness, spiritual richness that you get from the Psalms, and uh, it you get uh, so much more understanding of it when you um, uh, when you understand the historical background, when you uh, understand the illusions, what the symbolism. Uh, one of the um, uh, what a typical thing would be that, that uh, you have, uh, 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 you're saying to God that we're grateful because you have struck the beast of the reed. Well, you know, you put that into English, well, what are you talking about? What's beast of the reed? And so the idea there is it's a crocodile. Now, what's the crocodile doing in the Psalms, and why am I praying about God and the crocodile? Well, the story actually is that the crocodile was a symbol of Egypt because of the Nile River, and that the striking of the beast of the reed recounts God's great deeds in striking down the power of Pharaoh. So the, uh, uh, the Psalms is just absolutely full of stuff like that. And um, so that was a wonderful... Uh, uh, wonderful experience preparing that, and I get a, a great joy out of uh, teaching that to the seminarians every year. And you probably have uh, funny stories uh, about uh, uh, particular translations of seminarians. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, there was one famous one I, I, I tell uh, uh, that happened uh, when I was teaching in Warren about Circum uh, uh, De Dissime Secret Apes. Uh, and um, so that's, uh, uh, the last word is A-P-E-S. So the seminarian is translating, and uh, the idea is of a person being afflicted by other people. And so he's translating that, and he translates it as, they have surrounded me like apes. <laughs> so you had this image of, of being someone being surrounded by chimpanzees, but actually apes means that they have like, like bees, Okay, and they were buzzing around me. And so I thought this was hilarious. This passed into seminary lore uh, forever. And it's an anecdote I always remember when I come to teach that particular verse of the Psalms. But uh, then last year we were doing that uh, version of, we were uh, on that particular Psalm. And I was just about to tell the anecdote. And I said to the one seminarian, okay, now you translate it. And uh, guess what? <laughs> He Same didn't get the bees right that the apes appeared again. <laughs> so uh, 
those are the things that you remember. And maybe it's a source of a uh, little uh, distraction during prayer too? A uh, slight distraction, yeah. You want to skip over that a little bit. <laughs> and finally, Father, what about another monastic thing, the, the chant? You teach, uh, probably mission, mission Impossible here, how to read chants to <laughs> seminarians. <laughs> Teaching chant is something very difficult uh, uh, to do, especially to Americans and Americans of this generation because they don't have a, uh, um, uh, the practice or the habit of singing anything. Uh, they weren't taught that in school. We as kids were, were taught to sing you know, folk songs, etc., cowboy songs. We were taught chant, different things. So if you don't have that habit of singing and then you're in a situation where uh, you're supposed to sing and where in the long run as a priest you're expected to sing, that's difficult to do. So I uh, uh, periodically will teach a course of the seminarians on singing and how to read Gregorian chant. Uh, it's not actually that difficult to read Gregorian chant. The, the uh, looks a little funny, the square notes. But once you're able to decode it, um, you, uh, you retain that ability. So I've uh, tried that, and with um, uh, a moderate degree of success sometime, right? We, we, have, um, uh, we have no Pavarotti's of Gregorian chant at the seminary, but uh, I think that we do, uh, we do fairly well for ourselves on, uh, uh, on many pieces. But that's part of a tradition that is something that has to be uh, kept up, and uh, that has to be uh, acknowledged that it is something uh, uh, good and valuable. And to the extent possible, and to the extent of our talent, we try to pass it along. All right, Father. So we finish uh, this interview. But uh, before we do that, I would like to ask you for uh, I would say advice or a message or a suggestion to, to a young man who wants there's, to be a priest. Uh, th there's a lot to say that um, the, uh, of course, it's, it's uh, the noblest thing to aspire to uh, on one hand. On the other, it requires an awful lot of sacrifice to uh, become a priest. It, it requires self-discipline and study. Uh, but you're greatly aided by that in the seminary atmosphere because it, it, it forms you in the correct way. Uh, having seen, having been in many different seminaries and religious institutions and understanding a bit of the way that uh, things worked before the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the program that we have here at Most Holy Trinity is extremely balanced and you get um, the, uh, you get uh, an intellectual training in terms of theology and philosophy and all the other things that's really, uh, I think is second to none. And you know, I'm speaking from someone who has been in, in seminaries and religious institutions since 1965. So I've seen an awful lot. So uh, that, that part of the formation, also the regularity of life, uh, the, uh, the seminary schedule uh, forms you, uh, and uh, you have the, the, everything is in its place, that your academic work is in its, its place, the spiritual activities, the meditation, the uh, conferences that you get, uh, uh, spiritual conferences, etc. All those are regularly in their place. Certainly the sacred liturgy, we've always been conscious of, uh, uh, of promoting that and, and of uh, uh, continuing to the extent possible the most splendid things that we can with the sacred liturgy. The um, the uh, atmosphere of uh, the seminary is um, uh, a uh, friendly and a, a relaxed and a pleasant atmosphere, but it's a disciplined atmosphere. It's not the, uh, it was not the type of atmosphere that I remember uh, experiencing in uh, other institutions myself, uh, which was, uh, you know, somewhat less than, um, uh, shall we say, somewhat less than, than um, welcoming or somewhat less than, than pleasant. Okay, so it's a pleasant uh, seminary atmosphere. The seminarians, um, without exception, get along very well. Uh, it's a very well-balanced, um, very well-balanced seminary program. And we're very pleased with the 
we're very pleased with the products as it were because uh, our, our priests have all uh, turned out so very, very well and have gone on to um, do great things for the honor and glory of God. So if you uh, feel uh, inclination or attraction to the priesthood, uh, pray about it, investigate it further, maybe read a little bit more about the priesthood, and by all means, contact us at Most Holy Trinity. All right, Father, thank you very much for uh, this interview. I hope we have you again soon. Okay, you're most welcome. Uh,